Have you always dreamed of experiencing your bucket list cricket event? Watching an unmissable match in person, partaking in the roaring crowd and cheering on your favourite team? Now is your chance to experience this with Gulliver's Sports Travel. As the UK's leading and longest established sports tour operator, Gulliver's extensive knowledge and passion for sports tours and unbeatable service means you should expect a fantastic tour. Gulliver's packages can include everything needed, including guaranteed official tickets, accommodation, flights, transfers, exclusive events, tour merchandise, excursions and more. To find out more, visit their website, gullivastravel.co.uk or call them on 01684 878 937. Hello and welcome to the Wisden Cricket Weekly podcast. We've got a bumper show for you this week. Southern Brave and Oval Invincibles are the women's and men's 100 champions, so we'll discuss their triumphs and try and decide if three years is enough time to figure out if the competition is any good or not. <laughs> After a whole month without a game, England are gearing up for a turn to international action, which we'll preview, and uh, preparations for the Cricket World Cup are hotting up. You can now even buy tickets for some of the games. We'll also be joined by not one, but two hundred winners in Danny White and Gus Atkinson later in the show. I'm joined by Joe Harmon and Phil Walker, but first let's head to Mark Butcher for his thoughts on finals weekend. Hi Mark, Oval Invincibles are men's hundred champions. It's not quite another trophy in the cabinet of mighty Surrey, but this was a win with a particular three feathers flavour, uh, in particular from Tom Curran, who's been a, a revelation with the bat in this competition, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. Both he and, and his brother, I remember in the early stages of the, the blast, um, had been in a similar situation where they'd kind of rescued uh, the Surrey team from uh, from danger with Tom Curran coming up the order. Uh, but this was of a, of a different magnitude, I suppose, given that they were um, absolutely in the mire when he and Jimmy Neesham joined up. Uh, he's always been a, an amazing ball striker, actually. I mean, the, kind of, the thing that got him into his England prominence in the first place was the was the death bowling. Um, and, that, you know, that perhaps didn't turn out quite as, as well as, as it has done for his brother. But he was always very capable of, of, of striking a big ball. And, and I think the time out with the, the injuries has given him, um, you know, the time and the sort of like the, the mental room to really work hard on his batting to become a little bit more than just a basher um, for the last, you know, 10, 15 balls of an innings. Uh, and he showed that with, uh, with incredible skill in the final. Um, and, you know, uh, and the other side of it, I suppose, is as far away from being an affiliation to uh, to the Oval Invincibles with, with Surrey was Jimmy Neesham flying in for one game, um, being a hero and then disappearing off into the sunset again. So um, that is franchise cricket in a nutshell, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think Tom Curran might have already gone to play in the CPL as well. Um, I've always found him really interesting, and I guess the Currens in general, because they're so much better when they're actually playing cricket than when you watch them in a way, like there's something about their competitive instincts. Uh, obviously, they do have brilliant skills as well, but there's something about how they just rise to those moments. And I think you're exactly right that the injuries have in some ways helped his batting because he just wanted to be playing. Like he played the blast as a specialist batter. Uh, but this was just another level. I think his stats for the competition were a batting average of 175 and a strike rate of 177, which is quite handy. How... How, how how good could he be sort of as as an all-rounder? Because he bowled well. He took nine wickets in the competition. He still obviously got that well, ridiculous to describe as string, string to his bow. Uh, it's reductive to talk about everything in terms of, of England, but could we see sort of a, an actual kind of number six fulcrum come out from Tom Curran? Or is that is it a bit early to say that, do you think? Yeah, I'd say I'd say it's a bit early to say that. but And, and simply because England's stocks at the moment are so full, um, you know, he'd, he'd have to sort of put in seasons and performances and perhaps even, you know, not seasons, but other tournaments on a regular basis with that sort of impact before he really started to bash that door down. But I, I, I think it's, um, I think it's a, it's a great story because, you know, the, the, the injury, the back injury could have finished him as a player, couldn't it? And, you know, the, the effectiveness with the ball, you know, being a death bowler or being known as a death bowler, just, he, he just needs to ask somebody like Jay Dermack as, as to how, precarious of a career that can be Chris Jordan even um and so you know to to then to then add this incredible strength with the with the bat as well just means that he's going to be incredibly marketable isn't he he's already given up the four-day game so his his life for his career is going to be spent on the road um with lots of different colored kits on um and it, it's going to mean it's going to make him a lot of cash that is for sure and, and then if you know you do that successfully over a period of time then then who knows? And who knows what might happen with England once this, you know, this next World Cup cycle is over? 
um, and as they start preparing for um, the next T20 World Cup, which I'm, I'm sure is pretty soon, isn't it? Yeah, and I think if you'd predicted England's World Cup squad after the last World Cup, I think most people would have had Tom Curran in it. You know, he was in that one. You'd had bowlers who would, they get, they're getting on a little bit now to the extent that you wouldn't expect to be around in 2027. So Tom Curran might have a big part to play in that next cycle. I guess another guy who that's true of is, is Phil Salt, I suppose, who had, it was obviously brilliant in that eliminator when Manchester Originals completed the the highest chase in the hundreds history had another sort of sparky cameo in the final obviously they, they lost that game by a reasonable distance in the end but he was not the reason for that we haven't even really talked about him in the context of England's World Cup squad I guess Brooke is obviously going to take the headlines and if you can't fit Brooke and you can't fit Phil Salt in but you know with Roy and Bairstow you would expect them not to be at the next World Cup Phil Salt is going to be if, if he can sort of step up to that next level that's going to be massive for England I guess yeah well I mean you know you only have to look at the sort of the arguments raging over England's World Cup squad for this one um and know that you know that that Jason Roy is perhaps perhaps fortunate to be there given his recent form I mean and we're not talking about the last six months we're talking about probably 18 months maybe um you know Johnny Bairstow with the, with the injury and, and and at his age and whatever you know he's unlikely to make it to the well they won't make it to the next one so the, the top the top of the order is going to look very very different even um you know the likes of Butler Root Stokes for sure they they're all going to be too old by the time the the, the next world cup comes along after India um so that, you know starting in the caribbean in december um you know england will will look a very very different outfit with the likes of salt um you know for sure being up there as a as as an opener um you know obviously he's keeping skills as well give him another another string to his bow um you got somebody like Zach Crawley who perhaps will you know be putting his hand up for for a role in that as well um, Ollie Pope. I mean, there there, there is such a myriad, myriad of, of batters. That, I mean, Harry Brook, of course. Although we don't know for sure that Harry Brook won't make it into the final fifteen for um, for this World Cup. But it's a pretty strange way of strange way of integrating him into the team by not having him involved in in the warm up matches beforehand. If you were going to do that, mm. um, so look, it, in England England will look very different. Phil Salt will for cer- for certain, absolutely for sure, be a major part of um, of the, the sort of uh, the next. The next cycle the next four year cycle mm, yeah and it was amazing butler talking after the eliminator about what it's like batting with salt and saying like kind of saying it's great having someone who just goes out there out there and whacks it and scores so quickly and it's like if if joss butler's saying that you know you're probably doing something right and you've got something a bit special about you let's let's talk a bit about the, the the women's comp i guess it didn't quite get the same finish as the men's uh with a washout on the saturday and then a bit more of a one-sided game in the final but it was no doubt that southern brave have been the team of the competition, probably across all three seasons, you could definitely say that they've they've very much deserved this, having lost in two previous finals. Uh, and so brilliantly coached as well by by Charlotte Edwards. And I wonder, I mean, obviously, talk, talk, talk about, a bit about her as a coach, but she obviously has kind of passed over the England job. But in a way, is this is this necessarily that bad a thing if she can actually be taking players like Maya Boucher, for example, who's now going to get a chance at the top of the order for England and moulding them quite closely that's not a bad way for England to have it I guess yeah I mean again you know I'm going to put everything around the prism of of, of England selection but you know th- there is a there is an argument and Nick Knight has made it a million times in, when I've been working with him particularly around the white ball stuff is that you actually need your best coaches a bit further down rather than you know the, the guys who are kind of out there on the on the coal face, recognizing talent, encouraging talent, getting talent to a point where it can take after itself and then go and, and flourish in the in the England arena. So I don't th- I don't think that's a, a major problem. And, and who knows, you know, at some point the the England job might come Charlotte Edwards' way. It would be a, a fitting way for her to kind of you know to finish her her story in the in the, in the game. Um, but you know, the, Southern Brave and Annie Shrubsole, of course, she gets her, her fairy tale ending as well at, at the back end. But they've also, you know, Danny White and, and Smitty Mandana at the top of the order sort of set things alight from the beginning. Maya Boucher then has really, really stepped up and become the player that everybody hoped um, that she would be. Um, you know, the, the the story about Rihanna Southby and the sort of like the specialist wing keeper batting at number 10 and 11 is, is another good one. You know, I had a, and I know Rihanna anyway, but I had a chat with um, with Charlotte about her. Um, and she said, you know, she's she's worth her weight in gold because she stands up to everybody. She's, you know, she she takes us wickets. She's a wicket taker. So, you know, we don't, we're not too worried about what she does with the bat. And we've got enough batting 
um, you know, up the orders of cover for that. Um, you know, Georgia Adams, what tournament she had as well. I mean, she, you know, not as eye catching as far as the bat, but she slots in behind the sort of like the, the, the fancy dance at the top of the order and as, as leading wicket taker as well. I mean, nobody would have picked that from the beginning. You're, you're absolutely right. bang on to, to talk about South being obviously, you know, you, when you're coming to the end of these tournaments, you look at, you know, the top runs, top wickets. She didn't face a ball all tournament. She had one innings and was run out without facing. And yet she was in Wisdom's team of the tournament, uh, batting at 11 and had three stumpings in the final. And I guess that says something about Edwards as well, that you can sort of fashion a team in a slightly unorthodox way. And Adams is is a kind of a bit of a, a marker of that as well. But also something about, I guess, women's cricket and just the value of that wicketkeeper. And I guess it'll be interesting to see how that changes as well when you have bowlers who are getting that speed up. Will someone like Salvi be able to stand up to everyone when you're getting bowlers who are consistently high 70s, even maybe pushing the 80 mile an hour mark? I guess that will be the next step in her development and the development of the support, I suppose. Well, um, yeah, I guess that I get that's a chicken and the egg, isn't it? You know, just <laughs> her, her worth in, in that circumstance will only be known when there are more bowlers who are kind of, you know, requiring you to stand back um, uh, over, a, over longer periods of time. Uh, but what it does, what it does tell you is, is it shows you that the, the sport in, in the women's game is, is, is very, very different and is, hugely enjoyable because of that difference yeah. um you know the the fact that your your wicket keeper once again becomes a genuine wicket taker um in the side it's almost it's not an extra bowler that's that's silly but you know is is a is, is somebody that is going to take wickets for your team um as much as the you know the bits and pieces all rounder might do um is you know is is a huge is a huge boon for any of the sides, and you know England, England's wicket keepers. We've been blessed with, with some great ones, haven't we, over over the years? Um, and you know there there are one or two out there who are below the the radar, who are who also look very very handy indeed. Uh, and that is that is part a side of um, you know women's cricket that we should be very proud of and push as hard as we possibly can as well. Mm. Let, let's just finish with a bit on on Anya Shrubsoul, who got got the sense was never seeking out the the limelight or the plaudits, but has finished in the absolute perfect fashion with uh with winning that final and get getting the guard of honor she walked off and she just had such a terrific career hasn't she mm, yeah um you know the, the the magic moments for her um obviously the you know the final the world cup final at lords um you know being there at the end with with the bat on more than one occasion um and then striding off into the sunset with the with the big glittering trophy uh, you can't say she hasn't deserved it um and you know She's, she'll be like Charlotte Edwards was before her um, and, and Catherine Silver Brunt now. They're kind of a part of a, a triumvirate who will be, um, you know, flag bearers and standard bearers for the, for the women's game going forward. And people will look back and, and, and say that they were inspired by, by those three names. Um, and she fully deserves to be a, a part of that. I mean, what, what, what she does afterwards, I don't know. I don't know whether she, you know, she fancies a bit of the media or whether she's going to disappear back into uh, into obscurity down in the in the southwest but whatever it is she uh, she thoroughly deserves to hang those boots up and deserves all of the plaudits that come her way yeah i guess yeah because she'd be an england great even if she hadn't put in maybe the best world cup final bowling performance of all time <laughs> uh, so to, to have done both is quite something i guess well ch- cheers for your time mark and uh, enjoy sunny spain and see you in a week or so for the live show yep see you in a week so joe the hundred, then three years in. Uh, I guess I mean I enjoyed watching some of it this year. Uh, is is did you enjoy watching it? And is that enough, or do we need to talk again about its place in the English game, uh, where it fits into everything else, and all that sort of thing? Um, we probably do, but that's the harder bit. So let's start with the the easier bit of the the cricket itself, which uh, I really enjoyed as the tournament got going. Uh, I just purely personal experience at the end of the Ashes, I couldn't have cared less about the 100. There was something about the kind of the the drama, the narrative of the Ashes that made the 100 feel quite pointless in the lead up. And we did a podcast uh, sitting across in the stands, uh, across the way at the Oval, just after the Ashes had finished, giving a very sort of downbeat, oh, the 100s here. Because I don't think any of us felt particularly enthused by the prospect of, of that, having seen what we'd just seen in the Ashes. That being said, as the tournament went on, tough start bad weather it mm. felt like this could be kind of the you know the year that might end it in some senses not because we know it's contractually it needs to carry on but that a lot of the uh, momentum might have fizzled out but actually after the the bad weather um 
there were some really good matches and there was a game that we were all at here um, in this office watching the London derby, um, the men's game between the Invincibles and London Spirit. Really, really good game. Really engaged crowds. Uh, and it was really from that point in the tournament that I was much more engaged with it myself, watching a lot more of it on telly. Uh, and I really enjoyed finals day. Uh, I thought the men's match in particular was interesting cricketers doing interesting things and that's kind of what you're after really obviously there are there are bigger questions around how it fits into the structure but I think the ECB will be well I know they're really happy with with year three they're putting out the numbers which suggest it's been a successful year I think you've got some of those that you can you can share but but it, it I think undeniably this year saw progress for the tournament as a as a cricketing spectacle yeah I would I'd definitely say that yeah, well, let's go through some of those numbers. So record ticket sales, record attendances at the Aegeus Bowl, Sapphire Gardens, uh, Old Trafford, Headingley, Lords, Trent Bridge, some of those just in the women's, some of those in both men's and women's. Uh, they're hitting you know, 30% of the ticket buyers are, are women, 23% are juniors, 40% uh, of families, which is which is a big number. Um, uh, it's it, that That's all good. Viewing figures are up. Um, and I think... The, almost the speed with which those numbers have all come out shows that the ECB are, they are happy with it. But there's also, as ever, seen new reports in the press that they're still kind of thinking about how they might rip this whole thing up and and maybe start from scratch. And who knows how much of that is is hot air or or, or speculation or, or coming quite a long way down the line. But it still feels like this thing isn't completely here concretely to stay. For you couldn't say. You can guarantee in 10 years' time that the 100 will be being played, would you say, Phil? No, you couldn't guarantee that anything's going to be played in, in 10 years' That's time. True, yeah. We'll be underwater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's undoubtedly the, the year that it cements itself in, the, in the, the calendar, in the story. I think I'd be very surprised if the Richards at the top of English cricket are genuinely plotting to tear it up and start again, especially as it begins to present itself as a possible option for overseas investment. And I know it's a hoary old story to go down and talk about that, but that's how it sustains itself long-term with outside money um, because the the big overarching problem that it still has, and it's not its fault. I mean, I guess if you were particularly sceptical, you could say, well, it needs to have made money quicker. It needs to be washing its face more more swiftly than it has done in order to up the salaries of players. But I think that would be particularly churlish three years in. Most tournaments uh, are factored in to lose money initially. The big bash lost money for the first five years, etc., etc. I think considering it's only three years old, uh, the big problem will be persuading players to continue playing in it and attracting players from overseas. And it works both ways. Works works with the English players as well. because. If the American League, which obviously has IPL investment behind it, there's talk of that playing out, that that becomes a big issue down the line and the standard has to be maintained. Um, but I would say, considering everything that they were up against, every, considering the depth of division and opposition against it, I think to have got to this point, where those numbers speak for themselves and TV, specifically TV watching numbers are significantly up. 8% on last year watching men's games and more so watching women's games. 21,000 turned out just for the women's game for the final, 27 for the men. You know, they are hefty numbers. And crucially, it appears like there are people who are getting behind their teams. And that was one of the big huge questions around it you mentioned, you mentioned that oval game yeah um the amount of merchandise that's been sold is extraordinary that was the line i was going to pick out right well. okay yeah. yeah but you could sense it when you were in the ground at the oval game you could sense it over the weekend as well that people aren't just going for a day out but they're going to actually follow the people that they particularly like and that that comes from youth right it would be weird to be a middle-aged bloke and saying well i'm you know i'm a I'm a fan of the Invincibles because I love Sam Curran, but it's a natural thing for a for a 15 year old, or you know I'm a Southern Brave fan because because I love Danny Wyatt or whatever. You know it's 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 natural for young people to gravitate towards the players that they love. 
Yeah, twenty one percent increase in merchandise sales from last year, which you know, which is significant stuff. And I have to admit, that's one of the things that's caught me by surprise. One of my issues with the whole thing, I was willing to give it a go. One of my issues I didn't think would work was that there just wouldn't be that affiliation. I thought people would go along for a for an evening out or to watch some good cricketers, but I didn't really think we would get fans connected to their sides in the way that we seem to be seeing across the board. And I noticed when Tammy Beaumont scored a hundred, she talked about Welsh Fire fans not having much to cheer about over the last couple of years and that she wanted to give something back to the fans. And that was quite an interesting way of framing it because I haven't thought about the 100 in that sense, delivering for the fans. But I think you can see signs that that is a genuine thing now. Um, and that is a huge tick for the 100. Mm. And you're getting you're getting cricketing narratives as well. Like that Welsh Fire one, even though you know they, they didn't win either competition, I guess we'll get onto the rain that denied the women in the the eliminator but that in a way is the story of the competition right that you had a side overturning uh such a poor year last year uh, and that's the kind of thing the tournament needs as well i guess the draft and, seems to be working well the women's draft introduced this year mm -hmm. um which as, there was some skepticism about i think because yeah. of women's cricketers having more precarious uh financial situation than men's cricketers and the draft therefore being a bit more callous for them but it's worked at least from a competition sense i suppose yeah that's certainly my impression. And the, the men's table was really bunched this year, whereas quite early on last year, it was it was quite clear who was going to go through. There was only one or two places up for grabs. Um, whereas this year, had it just felt like a more kind of cohesive tournament. I also think in terms of the presentation of the thing, that first year was always going to be tricky because we were all, as, as journalists and the broadcasters too, getting to grips with this new thing and the terminology and people were tying themselves in knots. Now it seems to flow much more easily, I think, uh, the Sky presentation of it, as you would expect, is is excellent, but has got a lot better year on year as well, I think. It's stronger than the BBC's as well. And I, I, yeah. I deliberately watched both sides and I think Sky are obviously, they're, they're massively advanced anyway because they have people who, who are brilliant at what they do, but they're doing it week in, week out. And so you're used to those voices, I think. But the BBC are still, for me, they haven't quite got the balance yet. No, I agree. Do you know what I mean? Between it being They've funky and fun and a sort of Love Island offshoot and a cricket match between 22 really good cricketers, which is, of course, what it is in the end. And you can you can hang all kinds of baubles and, and bells and whistles on it, but in the end, that's what it is. And the majority of people watching it will be absolutely aware of that, right? It, it might open the door to a few, perhaps, but in the end... You, people are not staying in on a Sunday afternoon on a bank holiday and watching a women's game of cricket or Sunday night and a, for the men's game and and just being sort of having a passing at best interest in it and they're not there because there's a chap who used to be in in the jungle or on Love Island or whatever it is they're not really watching it for that um that that be something that perhaps the BBC can look at back themselves a bit more there's there's rumors that they are hopeful, optimistic that they will sign on again at the end of next year when their current contract runs out. Sky's is till 2028. The BBC's is till the end of 2025, 2024. Um, but then it's impossible to know because you think of the, all the things around the BBC as well. There'll possibly be a change of government. You know, they're terrified of the charter being squeezed ever more. So there's all kinds of uh, elements around that. I know that overall... They're delighted with their cricket output this summer. So hopefully they can continue to, to back the 100. But just I think with their production, there can be one or two ele elements where they can just just back it a bit more, you know. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, I tend to go to Sky now because yeah. the, the BBC is so great to me. But I, I, I always try and think to myself, what would this look like for someone? The BBC's covering what, what would it look like for someone with relatively fresh eyes to the game? Because I think if it grates on me, that's not necessarily... A problem but I do, I do think they've got a harder job to do basically they're, try, they're trying to balance they've got a balance to strike in a way that sky can basically continue doing what they do uh, yeah it's, it's and very, they haven't and bbc haven't nailed it yet I it's think very it's, difficult and this is where the whole this whole conversation gets trickier because that famous notorious line it's not for traditional cricket fans should never have been said out loud but is undeniably true <laughs> and they've been rightly pilloried for it because it was a PR blunder, right, top level. It'd be taught in in lecture halls. Nonetheless, the essential point of it stood up that it's not for you and me. So 
us, it's a good point that you make. Us sitting there watching the coverage or listening to the coverage or reading it or pontificating on this, that and the other, we're coming from a position of being cricket addicts. We're coming from a position of having spent far too much time in love with this thing. So perhaps that what appears to us to be slightly schmaltzy and shallow is absolutely the, the right way to do it. And there'll be people that are investing a lot more time analysing how to present these things than, than obviously we have. Um, I just feel like when it comes to the big games, you have to, you have to recognise that cricket by its, by its nature is a is it's a substantial thing and it's a serious thing as well and and in the end it's trying to establish itself as a legitimate substantial piece of sport in theater and i think you should, i think they should give their audience a bit more credit exactly and i, I think as you say having a kind of a c-list celebrity who's got an interest in cricket and have him on the bound i mean obviously there was the big faux pas or a little bit stronger than that but and I'm not defending him for a second, but also you put a, you put him in that situation. Kind of what what do you expect? Maybe not a clanger to that extent, but you're not going to get smooth sports broadcasting because he's not a sports broadcaster. And I also think about how, and I, maybe again, this is because I'm a sports addict, not just a cricket addict. So how I get into other sports might be different to how other people do. But actually, if you look at say the increase in popularity in F1, or you look at documentaries like the the Wel- Wel- Welcome to Wrexham, those okay they they build a narrative around things and they will certain simplify maybe certain aspects but they're also people are going to those because they're building a narrative because they're compelling pieces of of things to watch and that and and you're getting into it because and then you get into the intricacies of the sport through that and it's it's personal narratives and it's also the things that make a sport interesting those are the things that people are going to follow a sport for uh, mm. NFL might be another example here yeah. as well, which is like exploded in popularity over here. And you watch that coverage, and I don't think they dumb it down at all. A lot of it I don't understand when I watch it, but if I really had a connection to the game, I would investigate further. And I think it should be the same with with cricket. Really, if, if people are going to like it or they're not going to like it, give them a chance to appreciate what it actually is, rather than dumb it down to the extent that it's not even what we like in the first place. I, I've noticed as well on that theme that journalists written press journalists in particular uh have swallowed their pride a bit more and accepted that they have a job to do on this and constantly just debating as we are here you know the existential value or otherwise of this thing ad nauseum is one thing but also there's some good games of cricket taking place right in the heart of the english summer and you have to have a death wish for the game to want it to fail. And so finally, I think there are some, some journalists, some writers, some influencers, uh, some opinion formers who are accepting that there's a responsibility to at least acknowledge that the games are taking place, right? Yeah, and having more England players around, I mean, I think that's fair, right? right? So that's a big thing that, as well. That helps that's the window, well. I guess, yeah. Yeah, Um I noticed next year in Will McPherson's excellent piece for the Telegraph, he said the hundred. I think is a week later next year. Is that right? I think it might even be a week earlier. A week so earlier. It clashes with the last test. Shifts, so it, yeah. So sorry. Yeah. The point I was going to make was that it clashes with a test match, which is interesting in itself because that's obviously what they've done everything they can to avoid so mm-hmm. far. Um, and you might even get to the point where is so that's a Sri Lanka test, is it, or West Indies? Um, I think it's the West Indies this year. Second. Indies. Yeah, I mean, you know, given the state of that test series, maybe the 100 will be of more interest to some people than that test series anyway, which was, I guess, never going to be the case when it was clashing with the Ashes this summer, which was always going to take precedence over the 100. Yeah, I wanted to, I know you mentioned the private investment thing, and I think it seems like that's inevitable at some point. My question was more, how good does the 100 need to be? I guess people accept it's probably never going to be competing with the IPL. Michael Vaughan says that maybe with two more teams and some private investment, it could be the world's second best T20 competition. I wonder, like, does it need to attract the best international players or does it just need to not lose the best England players, if that makes sense? Like finals, the, the, the men's final, for example, is a, a, a brilliant question. occasion. But you look at the, the internationals in that game, it was Paul Sterling, Jimmy Neesham, Josh Little, Zaman Khan, like, you know, very, very good players. Uh, you know, you've got World Cup in there, you've got a guy who's picked up lots of money in the IPL, but these aren't the elite of the elite. But if you've still got, you know, Jason Roy, Joss Butler, it's going to feel like a proper thing. Uh, I think with eight teams as it stands, you can just about get away with it. Uh, 
there weren't too many games that I watched where I thought, oh, right, okay, yeah, this is underwhelming. This is an underwhelming level of quality. There are weak points in in, in most of the franchises, uh, especially in the in the men's side. Um, in the women's side, it's pretty much you, you have your pick. Obviously, with the exception of one or two Australians that you'd hope were to be in it, but who aren't. But nonetheless, you've got some real icon names in the women's side of things. But in the men's side of things, sure, you're lacking a couple of those massive, massive names. But I didn't feel like I was watching a rehashed, you know, middle of the road T20 game stage somewhere in provincial England. I didn't feel like I was watching that. Uh, also, there are so many cricketers in England, right? This is another thing where it does benefit itself and where we can, mad as it seems, we can have an 18-team, 50-over tournament running concurrently with it and it not feel like we are stretching things to the absolute nth degree because there are there's 450 professional cricketers and then you have a bunch of young cricketers, male cricketers coming through as well. So you don't... You can pick from a large pool, I guess, is what I'm saying. And I don't think they would, with the exception of India, you wouldn't be able to do that probably anywhere else in the world and maintain a degree of watchability. Obviously, they want the big names. It was a it was a pisser when Maxwell and Marsh pulled out just before because they would have really helped. Rashid Khan. Rashid Khan too. Well. We haven't discussed the women's competition much, I guess partly because everyone just accepts that that is definitely a good thing. And I suppose that's the thing that needs to be considered as well when talking about how the 100 might change, that that's the one unarguable benefit that it has had and preserving that is is necessary. I suppose this year it was slightly damper just because it was damp and you had this slightly awkward thing that happened a couple of times where uh, the women's game would be washed out. And I suppose this was most stark in the eliminator where the women's game was washed out despite getting most of a first innings thing. It ends up being called off at just before 5 p.m. and then you get a whole men's game in. Uh, there have been times in the past as well where the women's game has been played and the men's game gets washed out. So it's not just as simple as you can just eat into the time as much as possible. But do you think there could there be just more flexibility? Is it is it ridiculous to think you look at a forecast, you say, OK, well, it's going to rain from this point and then it's going to be clear so we can get 250 ball games in. And the other way as well, if we think, oh, it's going to rain from 8 p.m., then we cut into the women's one to start with and then make sure we get both in. Or is this just a necessary thing and you kind of have to just except that it rains in England sometimes. I mean, it's my instinct is it it looks like we've denigrated the women's game, but the rain could have come at five o'clock after the women's game was finished, right? Mm -hmm. And it could have wiped out the men's game. So I just think it's the fates of of, of conspired here, really. Um the idea of essentially a weekend long finals weekend is a good one to me because it propels the momentum from the Saturday afternoon to the Sunday night, it's a good way of doing it, right? Yeah, and if you can, if you can make the bank holiday weekend, the regular 100 finals weekend, I don't know how possible that is in the next couple of years with other fixtures, but then you've potentially got room for a reserve day somewhere as well. So, so that might be something that you look at. I mean, it, it certainly was a bad look for the eliminated finals, but actually when you get into it, I'm not sure there's that much more you can do I, I think as soon as you start saying why don't you just use common sense look at the weather forecast i think well the weather forecast often doesn't go along with common sense like mm -hmm. it can change quite quickly when you saw that old trafford not that long ago where we thought we were going to get a, a decent day of cricket and it just got wiped out i think that's a dangerous game to start playing so they need to be formal changes to the regulations rather than come on look at the weather forecast let's get let's let's change the, sh the timings um i don't know yeah it, it, i can't see how it works if you are wedded to that weekend and you wouldn't really want an eliminator, essentially a semi-final, to take place outside of that weekend, right? The double header is 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 the joy of the tournament. I think got to give him a pass on this one. Is my instinct? I don't know. But anyway, your regulations, man, Ben. Is there a way that this could? Because I was thinking on the way here, I was like, it it doesn't look good. I wish it wasn't like this, but I can't think of a better solution. Yeah, I mean, you, I don't think you want to start messing around with moving when the final was. I, 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 I just. Yeah, because I, I also, it's a bit frustrating sometimes in a test match when you know it's going to rain at some point or even the light's going to get bad and you, you can't start earlier and you know the last two days are going to get washed out and you can't get that time back earlier. I just wonder if you, you have match referees and obviously forecasts, I, I think there would be an acceptance if you read a forecast and then the forecast changed and that meant that you had played a bit more cricket earlier or that you played a 50 ball game and then it ends up being clear in the evening. So, so you toss on a 10 over game 
on the assumption that the rain is going to come at some point and you try and get it done or well if if the fork or in, with this instance i think it would be that you know it's going to be clear so that you can then play a bit more and then cut into the men's game a bit more or in other times i think you would say oh look it's going to rain from 8 p.m let's let's make mm. sure we get both in but sometimes it might not rain at 8 p.m but at least you've still got both games in. I, th I think there might be a way that that could work it might that might also look a bit silly sometimes but i think silly from a at least from a point of view of, of trying to, to to make the competition have a bit of a you know, yeah a bit more do you integrity do you know what would have happened if what we saw on eliminators day happened on the actual final day uh i'm not sure if there is a reserve day actually that's that's one to one to look up or whether yes i mean it feels like it you know it's not great what happens in eliminator if it happens in the actual final mm. that is really not good news so again having a reserve day for the final if there wasn't already one in place we obviously need to check that uh would seem sensible because that would make a bit of a farce of the whole thing and the, the more general point about the effect it's had on the women's game is obvious from a player's perspective um but the demographic of people going through the grounds and you mentioned the numbers earlier that that wins out over all other issues for me and the demographic of people watching at home as an extension of the people who are in the ground that is it that 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 wins out on all other doom mongering arguments for me because we cannot avoid the fact that while there were a handful of of female cricket uh, female cricket lovers and a handful of young people the numbers have undoubtedly skyrocketed and the hundred has been a part of that it's not been the, the, the central driver necessarily, but it's been absolutely a key part of that. Um, we did a thing in the magazine last year that I'm, you know, it was a good thing to have done at the time, I think. And I'm quite proud that we did it really because it wasn't the done thing to write about the hundred, as we were just saying earlier. But we, we asked lots and lots of people who'd gone to the games, the, 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 the last people that have discussed in all of this, the poor maligned hundred watcher, now, invariably, the people who got in contact with us um, were newish to the game and slightly baffled to be watching something and to be made to feel slightly guilty about it. And the, the, there was so, so much clarity from a lot of the people, and a lot of them were females, and there was one woman in particular who just said, well, it's definitely getting more people into the game. How can that be a bad thing? And, she would, and there was another woman who took her family with her, persuaded her sister to go with her. They'd never been before. Her mum and dad came along as well. And now it's a family outing and they do it. They go up, they, they go up to, to Headingley. Um, the atmosphere in, inside the ground, I know it's been said, but it's absolutely worth pointing out. Again, the atmosphere inside the ground is markedly different to a T20 blast game and a test, game, and a test match. We live here at the Oval. We're very lucky. The, the 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 noise not just the mood the noise is different for a hundred game to a t20 game and and in turn to a test match game so that for all the discussions about money salaries long-term sustainability the impact obviously the big question about the impact that it has on the 18 club model and so on and so on it's brought a lot more people to the game that would have otherwise felt like it was not for them. And that, to me, simplistic as it sounds, wins out over all other discussions. Yeah, I think one of the issues I had at the start of the 100, and I think a lot of people felt the same, was that the, they hadn't, the ECB hadn't done everything they could with the blast. There were things they could have done to essentially soup it up to make it a more appealing, um, potentially more commercially viable tournament. And I think to that still that point still stands in some ways with the men's tournament but if you make that point what you're completely ignoring is all the stuff that phil talked about because whatever you did with the blast that was never going to work for the women the women had to have something brand new so say we had gone down that route we would not have had the explosion of women's domestic cricket that we have we would have not have got these new fans in the same way that we have done uh, and i think that is that is a big sticking point with the argument that i myself had why didn't we just make the blast better? Well, it wouldn't have done the same thing. It might have done other things better. It would have certainly kept a kind of more cohesive county structure. You wouldn't have had all this uh, kind of infighting between cricket fans over the last couple of years, but you wouldn't have got the benefits that, that we've seen in terms of the women's tournament. As mentioned earlier, Southern Brave are champions of the women's competition. Third time lucky for them after being beaten in the final in the first two seasons. Key to their success was Danny Wyatt, leading run scorer in the competition and player of the match in the final. 
She joins the show from Hove, where she's gearing up for England's T20i series against Sri Lanka. Hi, Danny. Great to have you on the show. Um, let's start with Sunday. Your 100 champion, player of the match in the final. That must have felt pretty good. Yeah, honestly, it was such a great feeling after, you know, two pretty heartbreaking years, losing the first two finals. Like, we really, really wanted to win on Sunday. Like, well, I did anyway, and I know um, a lot of my teammates did. And, yeah, we really deserved the win. And we were arguably, we've arguably been, been the best team over the, the first three years of the tournament. So to finally get that trophy and to give Anya that send-off was, was very nice. Mm, yeah, I was going to ask about the the previous two years and whether the was the feeling was it pure joy or was there quite an element of almost like relief in there as well that you had got through this final and managed to get the trophy end of it kind of thing yeah obviously we were absolutely delighted to get the win um and yeah maybe there was a bit of relief as well like phew we finally done it and we didn't lose because there was a probably a lot of people that thought here we go again brave we're gonna lose again another final after losing those first couple of wickets in the first innings. Um, but that just shows, you know, the resilience and character we've got in our squad. Like, if me and Smitty have failed, then George Adams, my Boucher, Frey Kemp have performed and vice versa, which is a true sign of that we have got a very, very good squad. So I was just so proud of everyone. Um, yeah, lifting that trophy was, was a very special feeling. Mm, yeah. If, if you guys sort of changed anything this season after the previous two sort of near misses or is it kind of a we're doing the right things and the rewards will come if we if we keep doing it what what was the message from from charlotte um yeah i mean nothing changed at all i'd say from the first two years that we've we've played some really good cricket for three years we just haven't managed to get over that line in the final um but i knew we were going to win this was the a weird feeling a bit different to the first two years I don't know what it was there was just a sense of calm and um confidence that we were going to do it and yeah when I was buying up there I really really wanted to to get some runs and get um get us up to a big score because I thought anything over 130 would be very tricky to chase especially in a final at Lords where it's quite tricky to bat on anyway um and yeah, we just said before the game, Smitty Mandana did our pre-match um, speech on this time. So Lottie picks someone different before each game. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, she spoke really well and she just said, let's just stay in the moment and get the job done. And we did that. That's nice. Uh, how, how are you at the pre-match speeches when you have to do them? Yeah, I don't really like them, to be honest. I did mine before the Welsh Fire game down at Cardiff and we won. Yeah. So uh, I'll take that. <laughs> I guess you, you guys win most of the times. So maybe that's uh that's not too surprising. Yeah, true. <laughs> um, I guess let, let's talk a bit about the game itself because you mentioned a couple of uh, early wickets that you lost and you basically ca- carried the side through. How how has your batting been feeling? I mean, you know, you got got runs in the Ashes. You top run score in this in this tournament. Are you feeling in like a in a good place right now? Basically. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I felt in a good place for the last, what, five, six years, especially since I got the opportunity to open in T20s. Um, mm-hmm. You know, white ball cricket, the way I play, I'm going to fail more times than I don't. So it's just a matter of trusting my processes and judging myself on my intent and just, you know, reacting to the ball. That's when I play my best and just stay calm and chilled. Um, as soon as I step out of those zones, that's when I'm like, right, that's when I'm in trouble. Um, so it's just a matter of reacting to the ball, staying calm and chilled, and just thinking about more of the situation as well. Like at Lords, we lost two early wickets, so I was thinking I need to stay in here and, you know, just build a partnership with George Adams, knock it around, hit the bad ball, and hit my areas, stick to my strengths. Um, and you know runs will come it's it's pretty simple really just got to stay out there and um, show a bit of maturity use my experience and all of that and I just really really wanted it I was pumped like whenever I hit a boundary I was punching 
George Adams's gloves quite hard. Like I was, I was ready to to do well for the team, and I really wanted to lift that trophy. I, I said to Gad, "There's no way we're losing this. Come on." <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm just you know I'm keeping things simple. Um, I know what I want to do in training, and I've just got to you know what will be will be. Hope for the best, whatever the outcome. You know, I've I've worked hard, and um, what will be will be, and enjoy life off the pitch as well which is pretty key for me because you know there's so much cricket now and you can get stuck in this bubble this professional um you know you've got so much pressure every time you play you're getting judged by people but you've just got to embrace that I guess um and see it as a privilege and just enjoy it yeah well that, that pressure is an interesting one because it feels like there's more competition for England spots than ever before uh, with you know, you, you look at the squad for for this series, and, and Tammy Beaumont's not in it, having had such a a, a good hundred. Do you, do you feel a, a, a pressure to keep improving from that point of view, or do you kind of forget about that? And if you get the runs, the rewards will come, kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's not something I think of when I'm batting, but you know, there's always competition for places. It's been like this for years, um, and you know, it's all about focusing on me, and I always want to be better. Um, even at my age now, I'm 32. There's still so many things I can improve on. Um, so yeah, it's just you know doing well for the team I'm playing for at the time, and just being the best teammate I can be as well. And um, I think that's what it's all about as well, and helping the young ones come through and make them feel valued. Make sure they're you know you're bringing the best out of them to perform as well. Um, and when it comes to me performing, just sticking to my strengths and what will be will be. Yeah. Is is the um sort of playing a situation, is is that something that you've had to sort of work on and think about? I d I don't know, I don't know if you remember, but I we spoke like five, maybe even longer, when Mark Robinson was coach and you said maybe a bit tongue in cheek, but you're at your best when you, Robbo just tells you what to do and then you go and do it. And this in the final was kind of the opposite of that, right? You have a quite specific situation, losing two weeks early on you have to sort of adapt on the fly. Is that something you've had to work on or does that just come with experience and and time, I guess? Yeah, I think it comes with experience and maturity, definitely. Um, yeah, like I just knew straight away when we lost Boosh, I was like, I need to stay in here. So if I get out now, we're three down. Um, so it's just a matter of, you know, like I don't like to think too much when I'm batting, but obviously I'll, I'll think about the, the situation, like I've got to stick in. Uh, doesn't take a rocket scientist to think about that. But um yeah, back in the day like Robbo, I still now I still work better when a coach tells me what to do, like Danny, do this, do that. And then obviously go away and think about it and you know, just but it's not it's not a matter of going away from my strengths. Like everyone knows how I play now. So it's just you know, a matter of looking up the opposition, what they might do. So like we've got a big series against Sri Lanka coming up so I'm excited for that challenge but also I'm not going to change the way I've been playing over this summer um, and just concentrate focus on myself and um, yeah hope for the best. Yeah um, you mentioned coaches there and obviously at, at Southern Brave you've got one of the best in the business in in Charlotte Edwards um, and she's got you know just racks up trophies every competition she's in basically uh, what what is it that makes her such a such a good coach? Yeah, Lottie brings out the best in all of her players. She has so much banter with everyone. Like she's such a good laugh to be around. But when she's on, she's on, and she knows what she's talking about. Like in team meetings, um, we'll go through every player who we're playing the next day, talk about their strengths and weaknesses, where we're going to bolt them, who the main threats are, and you know, like everyone's got different needs so like for me I don't feel like I need to go to Lottie and say what shall I do against this bowler but someone young like Craig Kent might need to speak to her and she's really good in that sense like she'll talk her through you know what the best options are etc I mean she knows what everyone needs to do to perform at their best um and she's just so passionate and you can see that and like we wanted to win for ourselves and we wanted to win for Lottie and yeah, because you know, all the hard work um they do behind the scenes that no one else sees is um a credit to them and 
yeah, I can't really explain what they're like, but it's it's special playing playing under Lottie. We're very lucky. Mm, yeah, I, I wanted to ask about Maya Boucher as well. He obviously was batting number three uh, for you guys, but it seems like she's going to open up in the T20s. At least that's what it seems like is the case anyway, and that's what she's been doing for uh, for Vipers. She's played a fair bit for England, but all lower down the order. Uh, what what's changed for her to make a sort of like a, a a a player who's ready to open the batting for England? I guess. So Maya actually opened with me in the Charlotte Edwards Cup, and we we did really well together actually, and we love we complement each other quite well because she's she's got um, different strengths to me, and yeah, I love Boo. She's been working so hard, especially against spin, which is. Um, been one of her weaknesses. Um, she literally just comes down the pitch and it's it for six now. So if she can keep that up against Sri Lanka, that'd be nice. But yeah, she's um, she got the opportunity batting at six, seven, didn't she? A few times and um, she did really well there. But I think she's a lot better than a number six, seven. She's she's gonna be one of the one of the best batters we've had, I think, over the years. She's just. The way she hits the ball in the nets is with so much timing and power. Like she can hit the ball a long way. Um and yeah, she's a funny one. She's very popular around the group. She's a great girl and she's a great field as well. She's been working hard on her fitness over the last twelve months and you can see in her fielding in the hundred. Like she some of those catches she took she wouldn't have got last year because she wouldn't have been quick enough to get to the ball. So, um yeah, it's a credit to her she's I know she's been working really hard behind the scenes so she's ready to take the opportunity in this series nice and the last thing I've got to ask is just about the what the celebrations were like after the game because I guess you had not just celebrating the win but celebrating the end of of Anya's career uh, and I guess you also had all that time during the men's game before the trophy lift to to enjoy yourselves as well so what what was that that evening and and, and night like so we have, we did a few speeches in the dressing room we were in the home changing rooms at Lord's I can't get any better than that um, we presented Anya with a nice hamper from all the team. Um, did a few presentations, a few thank yous. Spoke about the season. Obviously, how how proud we are of ourselves on winning that first trophy. That everyone was buzzing, singing songs, and having photos on the balcony, doing TikToks. Lauren Bell's loving her TikToks at the minute. Um, and then we spent time with our family watching the men's game. And then we had to go and celebrate with the Oval guys after their match on the pitch. Um, had a few photos. A few of us were kissing the wicket. Saw <laughs> <laughs> those photos this morning, actually. Um, and then we were just with a few of the lads, our families in the gardens behind the pavilion. Um, and I'm not going to lie, I was very tired come midnight. Uh, I think there was, a, there was an after party put on. I lasted like an hour and then I had to go to bed because um, I had one eye on that we had to meet up with England the next day down here in Brighton. Uh, so I had to go home, pack, went home for like 45 minutes in Surrey and then came down here. So it's been non-stop and I haven't really had time to reflect yet. <laughs> yeah. But we're straight into it, three more games to go and then got a break coming up. So yeah. Nice. Well, good. Glad to hear you'll uh, be able to enjoy yourself a bit more then um yeah great well well good luck for the series and uh thanks for taking time to chat thanks so much ben cheers and we're now joined by gus atkinson 100 winner with over invincibles england's newest recruit and all of a sudden from almost nowhere one of the fastest bowlers in the world hi gus great to have you on uh let's start with sunday um what was going through your head and what was being said in the dressing room when over invincibles are 34 for five just before that partnership starts between uh, Tom and, and Jimmy Neesham? It was pretty quiet in the changing room, to be honest. Um, you know, building up to it, I thought we were going to... I was pretty confident with the final. And then, you know, after however many balls it was, we saw ourselves in a pretty difficult position. But, yeah, I was always always backing TC and Nish. Um, but, yeah, I had my pads on for a bit longer than I would have liked, but I didn't manage to get in, thankfully. But, yeah. Yeah. Where, where were you down to come in in that game? Number eight would have been? Nine. Nine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, how, how does how does it? It's an interesting thing, isn't it? With with Nisham sort of coming in, uh, just coming in for that for that last game, coming to the team, so in Paul Sterling, I guess, uh, and to come in and play and not quite that. 
having just come in for the back end of the tournament is crazy, isn't it? Yeah, I know. I know. It's uh, It was very good. I mean, couldn't have asked for much more, really. Um, to come in at seven, you don't usually get the, the chance to bat or six it was. Um, you don't really get the chance to bat for that sort of period of time. But obviously, they both played so well and could could get themselves in um which was which was needed um and how were the, the celebrations that evening did you have to kind of keep it a bit in check because of joining up with england or could you enjoy yourself uh, no it was good um <laughs> we uh stuck, stuck around lords for a bit and then there was a uh a, a evening hosted by the ecb in, in soho so all the lads went down to there and had had some fun um so with, with friends and family so yeah it was very nice Nice. Looking back a bit further, it feels like it's been a, cra- a crazy month and a crazy year for you. Um, mm-hmm. Our officers are up in the Oval, with, uh, you have a balcony that overlooks the pitch, and it feels like watching you from there feels like something's clicked this season in terms of your pace, which is generally, is, is that fair to say, first of all? And do you think, is that just rhythm and kind of experience and like knowing how you bowl, or is there something that's actually changed, do you think, that has allowed you to sort of step up to this next level? Uh, I don't think anything's changed, really. I think, you know, the winter really helped me, going away and actually playing some some cricket in the winter and having a bit more time just to work with, with Asim and Mood. Um, you know, I was struggling with my run-up a bit in the winter, then we got that sorted um, for the season. So I, I feel like, on a whole, I'm running in a bit quicker um, and, and, and I'm just a bit more confident, and, and that's sort of being shown in my bowling, running in and just basically putting in more more effort because of the confidence. Um, so, yeah, that's it, really. Mm. I think it was the game where Spencer Johnson took three for one. I think in that game you hit like 94, 95 on the, on the speed gun. Just, what does it yeah. feel like bowling that fast? Like, no one who listens to this show will know what that feels like. So if you, if you can try and expect it, then... Uh, it does uh, I mean, if, if it feels pretty good. I mean, I guess you have a bit more um, room to, to miss, I guess, because of your bowling quick. But I think when you are bowling quick, you can just sort of simplify it a bit, you know, I, and I guess you have to sort of think, right, what's, what's the batsman thinking here is, you know, what, 94, 95 mile an hour shows on the big screen at the Oval. So I guess you've got to look at it as you're on top and and not overcomplicate things really mm. but what what is that feeling like when you see like it's just such a big number 95 like when you see that yeah. that just must feel cool right no it was it was very cool very cool i mean i haven't hit hit that sort of speed before so to see that on the big screen was uh was nice just had a little word to whoever was at mid on or mid off and say did, <laughs> did you see that basically um and that was it yeah yeah um did it feel like a big moment kind of outside of it like um like to do it obviously on tv in the hundred as well i think you go from it felt for us like you went from someone being that people in the know were saying this guy might play for him quite soon to all of a sudden everyone's kind of talking about you i mean yeah i mean I've, in my head i've always sort of strived to get in the position where i'm at now and i think it's it's been i've always known i, I can i can get here um so to be able to do it in a, in a short period of time has been good because I obviously I've, I've said this before that I felt like my career was um you know was on hold a bit for my, for the first few years of um my career so you know for it to happen in such a short um time window has 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 been good yeah I'm just looking forward to getting started really listeners will want to kind of know what what that hold up what what kind of happened there like where like where you kind of come from and where where mm. you've been are you, are you able to just sort of like Sum it up in yeah. like what you think has changed. Or... I've been at Surrey, I think, six, six and a half years now. Yeah, my, my first three years, I've got a stress fracture each year. Um, and, and, that, and that ended my season early each year. Um, so I didn't feel like I was always sort of struggling to get back into it. You know, you have such a long period off, then you sort of rebuild go again start the season and then and then it's cut short again it was really hard to find any sort of rhythm or confidence or or anything really so and then, and then COVID happened which I think you know helped me physically helped me recover um and you know and and not to and for the short for the season to be shortened um sort of allowed me to get get through a season fully fit um and then it's sort of gone from there basically yeah 
it sounds ridiculous, but do you almost look back on it and feel like it's good that you kind of have them out of the way? Like, I don't know if there's been like a single fast bowler who hasn't mm. had a stress fracture of some sort and you always need to have it to then strengthen and then be able to bowl yeah. sort of regularly. And now you've kind of done it. It's not like, you know, obviously, you know, mm. who knows what will happen, but you kind of, it's almost like you got out of the way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, for people who start their career and have, you know, get get far in their career without injury you know for me I felt you know I hadn't played any professional cricket so I didn't really know what I was missing out on and I wasn't I was getting you know set back but it wasn't you know as bad as it as it, as it could have been um so yeah I'm fingers crossed now that they're all out of the way it's plain sailing but we'll see yeah um it, it looks like you'll be playing for England if, if not tomorrow then you'd think at some point in the next couple of weeks and then maybe playing in a World Cup in six weeks' time. I mean, I know you've said that you've always kind of wanted to get to, to this level and felt that you could, but but like, how does that feel? Do you have to, like, you, like it's a cliche, but do you have to, like, pinch yourself at all that this is kind of happening, or does it kind of feel like um, that? Time? Yeah, you know, as you said, well, as I said, it, it it's happened very quickly. I think I've been sort of lucky that the 100's been going on, so that's sort of been my main focus, so that's sort of you know, delayed the, the England stuff for a bit. So I've been obviously focused on the 100 and then joining up with the lads yesterday and then having our first training session today. Um, you know, seeing so many of my sort of friends from Surrey playing for England and sort of being in that position um, is pretty cool. Uh, when was the first sort of hint you got that England were interested? Was it was it near the start of this summer or would it have been towards the back end of last year? How, how, how long have you been on the radar? Uh, I think probably from the start of the season. You know, they're just monitoring my my progress throughout the season and watching me bowl in some games. Um, and and that, that's been it, really, yeah. And I guess you must have known you were in shot of an England call-up at this point. But the World Cup squad, that's, I mean, that's, you know, there's the 15 mm. best cricketers in the country that are in that. And that's yeah. you, you're one of them. What, what what was that moment like when you get told you're not just going to be picked in the England squad, but you're going to the World Cup? I was pretty surprised, to be honest. I mean. Um, I had an inkling I'd get picked in the these T20s coming up, um, but then to be picked in the ODIs and the World Cup squad was, you know, a, a bit of a surprise for me, but um, obviously very, very happy. Yeah, and the, the ODI thing is is interesting as well, I guess, because, I mean, it seems likely that the third list A game you'll play in your career will be for England. Is mm-hmm. I mean, as you've said, when you're bowling quick, you have a bit of mud fair and it does simplify things. Is that the plan that you just run in and bowl fast, or does playing fifty over cricket is there stuff that you're going to like need to learn that you don't know already? If that makes sense, I don't think so. I mean, it, I think it's pretty similar to obviously. I think it's just you mix, you know, your four day skills in with your T twenty skills. You know, you bowl your best ball. Um, yeah, obviously, I haven't played much fifty over cricket, but I don't think it's going to be a, a massive difference. To be honest, um, just. Yeah, as I said, bowl, bowl my best ball and then go from there. Yeah, nice one. Cool. Well, th- thanks so much for taking the time to, uh, to speak. Yeah, and, uh, nice. Good luck this week or Thank you. whenever the England debut comes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And we're now joined by Lee Gill, Operations Executive at Gulliver's Sports Travel. Uh, welcome, Lee, first of all. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, who you are, what's your role at Gulliver's and uh, how long have you worked there for? So I've been working at Gulliver's for coming up to two years now. Um, I've been in the operations team for those whole two years and what that sort of means is that we just put together all the individual parts of each package so whether it be the flights to transfers to hotel to the tickets um, that'll be my team putting everything together for you there. Nice and uh, and is, is that all sitting behind a desk or do you get to go on on the tours yourself? <laughs> yeah fortunately um, we do get to go on some of the tours. Um, I've uh, It's mainly behind a desk I, I'll be honest but uh, I have been lucky to go um, since joining Gulliver's I was in Amsterdam for the ODI tour um, and I was in Pakistan last December as well looking forward to this December when I might be going to the West Indies. Oh nice yeah two, two must have been two quite different experiences there what, what do you enjoy most about um, about cricket touring I guess? So yeah as you mentioned very very different experiences um, by far in a way the best part is just how together sort of everyone is as soon as you go away every cricket fan looks after each other um, whether it's people you haven't known when, when you're in Pakistan for two weeks together, you form really close friendships with people. And, uh, and there are even still people I speak to now that traveled with the Gulliver's tour. 
um, which is really nice. Mm, yeah, and and what what's been your sort of favourite or fondest or whatever? I know it'd be hard to pick it, pair it down to one. But what's been your best memory of touring uh, with Gulliver's? Best memory of touring with Gulliver's was probably seeing the four nine nine in uh, in Amsterdam. Yeah. Um, seeing Livingston and Butler go crazy was incredible, and everyone in thirty degree heat having just such a great time was amazing. And then you could compare that to then the other end of the spectrum being in Pakistan, seeing us win three tests out there in horrible conditions to play cricket, really. Um, yeah, it was amazing. It was something I'll never forget. Yeah, so you got to see the, what, the, the, the world record uh, runs in an ODI and then the world record runs in a day as well for test cricket. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah I've, uh, I have been quite fortunate and uh, I'm very lucky that uh, the England cricket team have decided to start putting on these world records, yeah. Yeah, true. A few years ago, it might have been a a bit different maybe for the ashes down under um uh, what, what 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 sort of thing can people expect when going on an england cricket tour with gullivers in terms of you know what, what what's taken care of what's included how much flexibility is there how does it how does it all work yeah so the um the main point of traveling with gullivers is that we take all the stress away um that's our main focus so uh, so once you book with us you know that everything's taken care of um so we can be we offer our tours, which are a set itinerary, but we can be flexible with that, whether you want to chop and change, add a few days on here, take a few days off here. If there's someone somewhere in particular you really want to go, um, then we can try and look for that, um, adding it on towards the end of a tour, for example. Um, but then, yeah, the main part of our tour is taking um, taking all the, all the stress away so you can just focus on enjoying the cricket and enjoying the location that you're in. And then we also put together quite a tour group feel um so i know that there are people that travel with us once met friends on tour and then they repeatedly travel again with us or uh, all that same friendship group that have all met on a good of us tour which is really nice to see mm, yeah and, and what has been the bit that you most enjoyed sort of away from the cricket like the, the bit of sort of local flavor because obviously cricket touring isn't just about watching the cricket is it it's about going to a place and experiencing it what, what's been the bit of that that you've most enjoyed do you think i think uh, i've been very very lucky to go to pakistan which not many people have been um especially recently and just the culture over there i yeah i know you said away from cricket but my favorite memory of that pakistan tour is we played a local game mm. so whilst we we're over there we organized a game against the local team and had people from the gulliver's tour all playing in that game and everyone said to me afterwards they thought i'd never think uh, they never thought they'd get a chance to play in pakistan and uh, and that was amazing and just how welcoming everyone is um, so yeah, that would probably be my highlight. Yeah, and 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 what what, what tours have Gulliver's got got coming up then? So coming up, we've uh, we've obviously got the World Cup in India um, and the ODI and T20 series in the West Indies, and then we've actually just launched our India Test series as well for next January through February. Mm, nice. And and the ODI World Cup is that you just go out for the for the whole thing, or that there are there are separate packages within that? Is that right? Yeah. So we've got various different packages in the uh, ODI World Cup. Whether you want to do sort of the first third, middle third, final third, put them all together. Um, we are also offering a hotel and ticket option. So if there's a specific game that you're desperate to go to, um, then we offer the ticket and hotel out there. And you can always extend that as part of a full holiday to explore India as well. That's what our main selling point there would be. Mm. And then how would I or one of our listeners book or, or, or speak to someone to find out more? So you can book online at the Gulliver's website or call our sales team on 01684 eight seven nine six one zero and if you do go online and sign up for our cricket newsletter you'll uh, be notified by email about all future tours as soon as we go on sale and when you sign up if you look out for our welcome email you'll also be eligible for five percent off any booking made before the end of november oh great and uh, and all, all that information will be in the uh, in the description of the podcast as well so if you if you want that just go go there click the link or, or, or find the number and uh, and get booking um, well, well, cheers, Lee. It's been great to chat to you um, and uh, yeah, enjoy what should be an amazing winter. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben. Great to see you too. We are having a live show as uh, if you've been a regular listener, I'm sure you'll know by now already. It's on September the 7th. We'll be joined by special guests, Mark Butcher, Ollie Robinson. Phil will be there. Joe, you won't be there. I won't, but don't let that put you off, people. Yeah. Still get your tickets. We need to find some way to get Joe involved, don't we, Phil? Phil doesn't think so. Phil thinks I'm out, out of sight, out of mind, which is fair enough. The, the only way to do it is is a live link with him no, emblazoned across the back wall. I, th I think not doing that. Life size cutout, maybe. possibly, or, or maybe maybe like a slideshow of Joe's best moments in photographic form, just through his life. Set to I mean, that will definitely music. have a kind of funereal <laughs> feel to it, I think. But. <laughs> 
Anyway, get your tickets. There aren't many left. I know I know it sounds like we're lying, but we really aren't. There aren't many left. Um, and by this time next week, there definitely won't be any. So if you do fancy it, and frankly, you should, then get stuck in, please. Yeah, just to remind you, there's a, a drinks reception. Uh, there's a curry. So it's, it's almost an end of end of season dinner rather than a, a just a live show. Uh, so it's really, really well well worth your time and, and your money. So get it's, those It's tickets. an end of season dinner before the end of the one dayers and with still two rounds of the championship to go. But it's been billed as an end of season thing. It's the end of the hundred, which is the only thing that matters now. It's the end so. of the hundred. Yeah. And the end of days. <laughs> Joe, it feels like every week we end up discussing Harry Brook in some capacity. And uh, we're going to come to the, he's going to play in the England T20s, presumably against New Zealand. And then last week, you know, just after we were sort of, you were trying to make sense of uh, how he'd been left out of England's World Cup squad. He goes and plays maybe the best innings in the history of the 100 uh, off 45 balls. Next highest score is is 15 from Adam Hose. Uh, it, I mean, it was it was some knock. I, I don't know. Does it does it change anything? Kind of should it change anything? Um, I don't think it will change anything in what England are actually going to do at, at this stage. I think it will probably still take an injury or a terrible series from Milan to open the door. To Brook, but I think it reinforced. I mean, we were texting each other going, this is ridiculous. How's this guy not in England's World Cup squad as it stands? And I think there would have been similar messages around the country going back and forth. Because when you watch someone play that well, it's very hard to figure out how you can't find a spot for them in a squad. But it was interesting. So I said, I, I guessed last week on this show that if Owen Morgan was in charge, that he would have wanted Harry Brook in his squad. Um, but he said himself, he can't find a way for Brook into his into his squad. He would have done the same thing, which surprised me. But you know he's got a decent track record, Owen Morgan. So I guess you his opinion carries a hell of a lot of weight. Um, I thought interestingly as well, he said this is the squad they picked and they need to stick with it. Mm-hmm. So basically, whatever happens in the next month or so, uh, this is the fifteen they picked, and I, that surprised me even more because Owen Morgan as we've talked about before, he's born pragmatist. We saw that with the Joffre Archer selection. Not the same circumstances. Obviously, he came available at the last minute, whereas Brooke has, has always been available to them. But I, I'd have thought Morgan would have just wanted the, the best players available at the best time to win to win a World Cup. And it might be that we get to that point where it seems almost laughable that Harry Brooke is not there and someone else is in, in his place if they've had a bad series and Brooke tears it up in the T20s. Uh, and this was always a possibility and, and Brooke... Did, <laughs> Brooke absolutely nailed it. That was, I mean, an absolute stunner of a knock, wasn't it? Um, especially when you see how difficult everyone else on his team found it. So yeah, I, I continue to be baffled by his non-selection and that might only, uh, that feeling might only strengthen over the next couple of weeks as we see them take on New mm-hmm. Zealand in T20s yeah. and then ODIs. The, the one thing I'm sure of is that they won't change it. I can't see them just saying, okay, well, actually, Jason Roy, you struggled in these here today, gone tomorrow, ODIs to fill the schedule and or David Milan, you know, you nicked off a couple of times. So sorry, thanks, but no thanks. Two weeks before the start of the tournament, no chance of that happening. Mm. And so Morgan's point um, is just, a, I think, a reflection of the reality that once you pick that that 15 and made it clear that that is your 15, then, that, then that's how you go. Uh, I don't agree with it. Um, I would have had him in front of either of those two players and to hell with the fact that you'd be shaking batting lineups up. Um, he's just clearly one of the best four or five white ball batters in, in the country. Um, so there you go. But anyway, that's what it is. That's what it is, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what it is. Okay. Um, just on, on Gus Atkinson, who's obviously great, great fun, um, went round the park in the, the finals day uh, on Sunday and um, looked a bit frazzled. Did I a thought. bit, did a bit. Uh, and it just reminds you just how raw he is. That's all I'm saying, really, that he hasn't played very many big games of cricket. And while he's the wild card, it's also, it's a, you know, it's a daring gamble. And I get entirely why they've done it. And I'm as excited about him as anyone else. But it just reminds you that he's going to be going into the, the hottest pressure cooker out there, an Indian world, final, uh, world finals and that is a that's a big ask. It's a big ask for him. Yeah, and I guess just to bring it back to Brook quickly, I was surprised Butler basically, and maybe it was just a never say never sort of throwaway line that he said about Brook being in the World Cup squad when asked after the hundred, uh, after Brook's century. I mean, was there any chance for him to get back in? And he said, 
to, he said even there might be possible changes made to that provisional squad, I guess. Uh, but the thing with Brooke, which so is was that a specific quote? Uh, yeah, I can find the specific quote, but yeah, he, he was asked. About I read it more as like, who knows what might happen between now and then. that's which, how yeah, I read that's, it, that's which, which could be an injury, obviously. Yeah, and, and that, that's why, I mean, this, the, hun- the century, as good as it was, it shouldn't change anything because we already knew Brooke could play that kind of knock, which is why it's frustrating that he's not in there. But England can't, be, can't have been surprised by what Brooke did because that's the, the caliber of player he is. Whereas I guess with Archer and related to Atkinson, you didn't know completely that Archer was going to step up so seamlessly. So there did need to be that kind of wait and see element. So there was more of that justification for making that change because you had more knowledge then than you had when they picked the original squad. And England can't really know more about Brooke really as much as, you know, he might go and tear the place down because he's Harry Brooke. He's probably going to tear the place down, I guess. Um, but I guess that's the main uh, point of interest from an England point of view going into this series, especially with John Turner and Josh Tung ruled out, which is a which is a shame. Uh, I guess it's also a big week for, for Darren Milan, who I guess you'd think would play those T20s, though there's no guarantee, but has obviously been dropped by Trent Rocket. So if he, I mean, if he is left out, there'll be people saying like, well, how come he's in England squad and isn't, this, isn't in the slightly second string T20 team? And if he plays and doesn't get runs, then those whispers will grow more. And if he plays and does get runs, then great. England have made the right decision. They've backed the right horse, I guess. Yeah, you know, I think he probably will play. It would be insensitive not to play him. And his record's very good. Mm-hmm. And, he's got, and he's got to find some form, hasn't he? If you, if you that's don't, the crucial yeah, thing, yeah. that they have to want him to get runs. And we have to want him to, everyone has to want him to get runs because he's in the side. So forget the, the, um, the umming and ahhing around who should be or who could be instead. Forget that because he's in the side. So you want him to, to play himself into form. The World Cup is, what, six weeks? Something like that? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, it starts now, doesn't it? Mm. I guess we should talk a bit about the other lot that England are playing. Uh, there is another team involved. New Zealand Joe, World Cup, Dark Horses? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's slightly weird that we've got three, sorry, four T20s before we get to the four ODIs. And it feels like the ODIs are the ones that matter because they're building towards the 50 over World Cup. Um, yeah, and the T20 sides just... Uh, Look through the New Zealand squads, just any kind of points of interest. There's Mark Chapman in the T20 squad who had a ridiculous series in Pakistan recently. 290 runs for once dismissed across five innings. Uh, got a century in the last match of that series. Given that form, it's a bit surprising that he's not in the ODI squad for this series. Slightly strange, especially when you look at that New Zealand side. And it's kind of what you expect, that very, very solid, extremely good players, but potentially lacking a bit of punch in, in that middle order. Um but in terms of the, the 50 over sides, again, I don't think there's going to be much to choose between them. Oddly, New Zealand ranked four in the world now, England five, for what that's worth. Probably very little given that <laughs> there's not much ODI cricket played. But they've had very similar records since the last World Cup. Uh, and New Zealand's bowling attack will look extremely familiar. Saudi, Bolt, Ferguson, Henry, Jameson's fit again, so he'll be there. And Adam Milne is... is considered fit enough to play 50 over cricket now having largely focused on t20 so he'll be there as well in the odi squads but the batting will look very different from that 2019 obviously the headline news is kane williamson is is still not fit recovering from torn cruciate cruciate ligaments they're hopeful though name. for the world cup they've apparently. given him a deadline of two two weeks but I, it looks like reading between the lines i think they're going to pick him because the tournament is so long that they can bring him in for the latter stages and and cover his absence uh, up until that point but yeah I, I, speaking to someone who knows knows his his likelihood uh they're pretty confident that he plays Watch yeah mm. but not at the start of the tournament presumably i don't know but just that but he'll be named in, in that squad, squad. yeah and, uh, and if you look at how new zealand kind of got through the last world cup the thing that they're just very good at is not dropping games against the sides they should be i think they are not sure if they won a game against the top five in the world cup group last time but they beat all of the bottom uh all the bottom five and that and that that was enough for them i guess and so if they could back themselves to do that again and then came Williamson comes in for the last few games of the group in the semis yeah. then that makes sense I suppose. I'm, yeah. I'm quite interested by the odis actually how how engaged i'll be in the in the games themselves not necessarily the contest because i'll forget who wins as soon as it's done but in the games themselves and i say this in the context of having watched quite a lot of 50 over odc cricket Mm -hmm. this summer and finding my finding my attention this might be a reflection of me but finding my attentions wandering in those middle overs 
And it's, it's the age-old question, you know. Those that was always the way, though, wasn't flat, it? Middle overs. Yeah. yeah, but a good 50-over game doesn't have those because there's still that chance of the game ebbing and flowing and changing direction and so on. Um, there aren't, there's no dud moments in a, in a good test series between two good sides, as we've just seen. And there's not enough time for there to be real dud moments in a T20 game or a 100 game. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing how, I, how much I enjoy it the the contest itself and how engaged I'm going to be because some of the 50 over stuff that I've seen when the bowling attacks haven't been strong enough to change the direction of the game you're having players reared on t20 but not enough of a riposte from the from the bowling side and so there is a sort of there's a plodding predictability to it through the through some of the middle periods of some of the games I've watched this year there's also to be said in that tournament there are lots of side with very sides with very depleted resources so they, sure. they, they they don't really have the flexibility to play in different ways a lot of them have only got two or three batters who can't go out hard whereas England will just keep coming won't they a, a million percent and and I've been mindful of that and that the, you know the contests can be a bit skewed because of as we know because player availability is, is a big issue there um yeah I'm just interested to see if if I'm still going to be properly invested throughout the hundred overs of these games from a from a, the undulations of a cricket match perspective. Mm. It's also interesting contact. They haven't played each other in 50 over cricket since the World Cup final. Mm. So, so there's obviously going to be loads of references back to that game. But yeah, back to the batting line. I mean, there will be quite, I think Nichols and Latham are the only two that are still around from, from the last World Cup. It's weird to think how much time's passed that Conway, I was like, I'm sure I've seen Conway play 50 over cricket against England, but I haven't. He came in. So, so he, he will open with is, is Finn Allen in the Finn Allen's in, as well. Finn Allen's in the squads and is obviously the kind of the explosive option. But uh, Will Young did very well mm. in their series in Pakistan. So I, it, on form, it would be Conway and Will Young at the top. Daryl Mitchell at three, who's come into the fifty over side mm-hmm. since that World Cup as well. Mm. Um, but I suppose Finn Allen will have a chance during the T Twenties as well to press his case. Yeah, um, and if he comes out and smashes. I guess that's the thing. It's a thirty, a fifteen ball thirty, and a T twenty is so much more valuable than it is in an ODI. But well, that's it. And his his strike rate is phenomenal, like right up there with the very best you've ever played T twenty cricket. But do you know who's the highest? Uh, I do because I read the thing that you wrote do you last know who's week. Who's the highest? Andre Russell, Glenn Maxwell. He played in Sunday's final. Josh Butler, Jamie Overton. Oh, okay, comfortably as well. By the bye. Yeah, there you go. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, Glenn Phillips as well. Will he be in the side? Yeah. So well, squad. Yeah, I don't know. He's obviously banker for the T Twenties. Best uh, fielder in the world, arguably. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, they'd have a good side to leave out Finn Allen, you'd think, especially with the the way that the fifty over game is becoming increasingly a imitation of the twenty over game. They also haven't got Jimmy Neesham, who will be part of the World Cup squad, but he's gone home for the birth of his child, so they're kind of lacking a hitter in the middle order. So I, I suspect they find a way for Finn Allen to get in somewhere even if it's not necessarily up top so he basically just rocked up for the 100 final then yeah fair enough yeah. okay <laughs> um we discussed the rankings there and i suppose one of the big bits of news from outside of england this week is that pakistan are now the number one ranked odi side in the world quite a lot of fanfare considering they were ranked number one in may for a little bit but um they beat afghanistan 3-0 in a really entertaining series and how much either of you <laughs> fo- followed this but, i didn't um, see any of the footage uh, it was it, it it was it was tough to watch in the UK as and to actually find a stream, but there were very long highlights on the ACB's YouTube channel, and uh, you can uh, go and watch watch lots of social media clips and stuff. Um, Pakistan just looked really good. Basically, they've got a, a functioning top order with two very consistent openers. One of whom is sort of a good contrast there between Imam Haq, who's the uber consistent. Pakistan man is a bit more aggressive. Obviously, Babar's Babar, and Rizwan is now solidified in that number four spot. And then you've got. Uh, Shaheen, Nazim Shah and Harris Ralph as your three quicks which is a very good pace tack and an incredibly watchable one and then they haven't quite sorted their middle order but it's not because they don't have options they've got loads of options I think they've got Salman Agar and Saud Shaquille if they want kind of more of a specialist batter they've got Iftikhar Ahmed who's a uh, bowls and spin and has a really good record over the last couple of years they've got Fahim Ashraf who can bowl pace they've got Mohammed Nawaz who can bowl spin and obviously Shadab Khan will be one of those four and he's mm. a kind of a, of a cheat code of a cricketer. So they look really, really good. I, you'd expect them to, just based on on their team on paper, to be a very competitive side at the World Cup. And actually, weirdly, even though they lost 3-0, I think there's enough from Afghanistan to suggest that they'll put up a better showing than so they did tell last me about time. The, tell me about the openers then. So they put on 
Well, one of them got 150, the other one got 80 odd in the second game, I think, but on about 200 between them. Yeah, and it's their second double century stand of the year. Two young lads. Yeah, both 21, very similar records. So uh, now Ramon Gerber's got 500 compared to Ibrahim Zadran's got four. Uh, yeah, that, their batting is very dependent on those two, which is why I think they're not really semi final hopefuls. But if those two put up enough of a total against a good side, and this was a really good, it's Pakistan's first choice attack that they did this against. So that, that means that. They could kind of maybe do it on their day against pretty much anyone. And then in Fazal Haq Faruqi as well, they've got a seamer who can take wickets with the new ball. And then we know all about their spinners. So there's enough well, there that they'll cause teams problems, I think. Yeah, they're not going into this tournament with an expectation of winning it. But if they can bring through one or two batters and put them on the world stage, that is advanced, an advancement for them because that's what they've never really had up until now. They've had players that have adorned the story here and there, but... They've never had a batter that you can say he is among the top class players in the world. And so if they can bring one or even two of those openers through over the next seven weeks in, in India, then 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 that's that's a great achievement in itself, I think. Mm. And if and if you're going to watch anything that series, go to the end of the second ODI, which had a, a Mankad and then Nazim Shah hitting two fours in the last over. Oh, I have seen this. And then yeah. sprinting off and throwing all of his kit everywhere, just as he did in the Asia Cup last year. Uh, that was a lot of fun. They'll both be in action in the Asia Cup this week as well, so more chance to discuss them. And just quickly on Afghanistan as well, I mean, two 50-over World Cup appearances, but they haven't had one in Asia yet, which mm. I think is quite crucial. Obviously, they, they didn't have a great tournament in England last time, but the conditions didn't really suit their strengths. Uh, and obviously, Australia and New Zealand four years before that. So this is definitely their best chance of making a proper impact at a 50-over World Cup. Mm. Um, On to the one-day cup. The Worcestershire dream is over, unfortunately. Mm. They needed 35 from the last four with six in hand uh, against Hans, but couldn't quite get over the line. Um, Gloucestershire hammered Lancashire in the other, not quarterfinal, but playoff game, whatever you want to call it. Uh, The semis are about to start uh, as we speak. So we'll have more on those in next week's pod uh, when also the Couch Championship will have resumed, we'll have lots of T20s to discuss, including England Women's Series against Sri Lanka, which there was a, a very good preview of on last week's pod, so make sure you go and dig that out too. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Cheers.